Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this Civ overview, we're going to be taking a look at the infantry and naval Indian civilization, the Dravidians. Now, there are already a handful of civilizations with a focus on the combo of infantry and navy, including Vikings, Malay, and Japanese, and much like those civilizations, Dravidians also have pretty decent archers. At the same time, and fair warning to any sensitive viewers, I'd encourage you to look away if you're a bit squeamish, because I'm going to show you their stable tech tree. It's pretty horrific, and at first glance makes them appear to be an honorary fourth American Civ in the game. Arguably, even Aztecs have a better stable in Castle Age if they manage to convert one and make Shalotta warriors. Despite this, as we'll see, Dravidians have a great feudal age, fall apart a bit in Castle Age, and finally emerge with an absolutely insane unit in Imperial. Let's check them out. We'll start off with their team bonus, which is that Dravidians and their allies gain 5 population space for every dock they build, effectively giving you a free house. This is obviously not a lot of help on land maps, but on water maps and nomad this is a very good team bonus, and actually saves more wood than the Vikings dock discount, even before factoring in the construction time of building a house. On Nomad especially, this is great as you have to build a dock and house right away, whereas this does both at the same time. The fact that everyone on your team can do the same thing means this is just a great bonus, assuming you're on any map that you plan to dock. Moving on, their first civilization specific bonus is they receive 200 wood when advancing to the next age. Even just entering feudal, there's a lot of different ways you could approach this bonus. You could either see it as a free archery range or stable, you could see it as 3 farms plus a house if you're booming, or since 200 wood is almost exactly what 4 villagers collect in the roughly 2 minutes while you're advancing to feudal, you could then move 4 villagers off of wood onto a different resource, like food or gold a bit earlier. You then get another 200 wood in early castle age, which is perfect timing for making sure you have the wood needed for 2 town centers and all the accompanying farms. That said, the final 200 you get in imperial age is something you probably won't even notice, so if there's a downside to this bonus it's that it really doesn't scale with your economy, and tends to fizzle out a bit in the late game. Next up, their other economy bonus is their fishermen and fishing ships carry plus 15 food. Similar to the team bonus, this is nice on water maps, but is of absolutely no help on full land maps. To give a rough sense of how much this helps, in this example at this distance, Dravidians end up collecting over 20% more food. Keep in mind, fishermen can also drop off food at docks as well, and this will cut down on their walking time proportionally even more, as they only carry 10 by default instead of 15 food for a fishing ship. Their next bonus though is what really makes them an infantry civilization, and it's that their barracks upgrades cost half as much. This can help very early in the game, with a men-at-arms opening for example, saving 70 resources on that upgrade alone. They're a good way to add early pressure, and also pair nicely with archers, and that combo of units is I'd say the most common opening plan for Dravidians, also playing off their early 200 wood bonus in Feudal on top of this. Likewise, in Castle Age this gives you potentially over 400 resources worth of savings for Longswordsmen and Pikemen alone, which are units you'll see Dravidian players try to use in 1v1s especially. The greatest savings though come in Imperial Age, first with 750 resources saved upgrading to Champion, but also consider the expensive tech switch into Halberdier, whose usual 600 gold cost especially can make that tough in the late game. While infantry itself is undeniably cheap, its upgrades not so much, and in total with all barracks upgrades this bonus theoretically adds up to over 1700 resources in savings. Their next bonus is their skirmishers and elephant archers attack 25% faster. Personally, I think this bonus in particular really ties the civilization together nicely. You have a good feudal opening already for men at arms, archers, or even theoretically scouts, but usually you stall out in castle age with no knights at all and just generic crossbows. This bonus at least gives you two castle age units that are above average, even if you don't make them every game. Faster attacking skirmishers is great against archer civs of course, but maybe more interesting is the elephant archer is included here as well. Keep in mind you don't have bloodlines or husbandry at the stable, and probably won't even build a stable in most cases, but as an example, against a knight a Dravidian elephant archer can win one on one, whereas Gujar and Bengali elephant archers lose this matchup despite having better looking stats. 
there's an argument this passively makes Dravidian Elephant Archers the best in Castle Age, and in fact they beat the other two with equal upgrades, thanks entirely to this bonus. Even with the extra attack rate though, Dravidians still struggle in practice against good Knight Civs in 1v1s, as you lack a lot of mobility. In fact, the Dravidians' worst win rates are against Lithuanians, Franks, Berbers, Tudans, and Poles. Maybe you're noticing a pattern here as five very strong Knight Civs. Even a simple combo of knights and skirmishers can be pretty hard for Dravidians to handle in the mid game. And personally, I see the Elephant Archer as more of a team game unit, where you can really mass them up in the late game. So that's their bonuses, where you can see things are pushing you here toward infantry and archer counters, with some extra help on water maps thrown in making them a great ally. Now let's move on and take a look at their infantry unique unit, the Urumi Swordsman. Now, this is quite a good unique unit, but at first glance, it's not super impressive, with actually slightly worse stats than a long swordsman, having less HP, attack, and armor. They also cost roughly the same, which can't be brought down with supplies. They are slightly faster than the swordsman line and are created in a very quick 9 seconds, but their value really comes down to their charge attack. This adds plus 12 to their first hit and then takes 24 seconds to recharge. In addition, that one extra attack also has area damage, dealing half of their attack to any surrounding units. Doing this once every 24 seconds may not sound incredibly impressive, but is enough to actually make them cost effective against long swordsmen, wiping out a huge chunk of their HP in the first second. Even more impressively, against Castle Age Knights, they end up winning with roughly balanced resources. So you can really see the charge attack is no joke, and Rumi are a nice option against mass melee units. Naturally, they're improved by discounted barracks and infantry blacksmith techs, and have a reasonably cheap elite upgrade, not just improving their stats, but also shortening their recharge time. When they really hit their stride though, is with the unique tech Woot Steel, letting them ignore all of their target's melee armor. Admittedly, this is starting to get pretty costly, but with this tech, a charge attack deals 29 damage to any unit you're targeting, and 15 damage to any unit around them, regardless of armor, though they then revert back to being something comparable to a long swordsman for 20 seconds. If that doesn't sound overwhelming, consider they can beat paladins with equal resources, and maybe even more impressive, can beat anti-infantry specialists, like elite jaguar warriors, elite samurai, and even elite teutonic knights. In fact, Elephants, Cataphracts, and Conics are the only melee units I've seen hold up against them, and outside of that, ranged units are probably the best way to handle them. While they do rely to some extent on having a critical mass, they play a very useful role as a soft counter to infantry and cavalry, becoming progressively stronger in the late game. Moving on, their other unique unit is the Therissidae. This is an Imperial Age only unique unit at the dock, and here we have them compared to a Galleon, Caravel, and Turtle ship. At first glance, they look beefy, with relatively high HP, armor, attack, and four extra projectiles on top of its main one, though the main projectile actually does the majority of the damage, and the extras are all just doing one to any target, so they're mostly for show. They cost double the regular galleon, and even just looking at them, you get the sense this is about population efficiency, but primarily I think of them as a galleon hunter. Matched up head to head, they're taking 4 damage from the Galleon while dealing 16 damage per shot, and end up winning convincingly, even if you're at a considerable resource and numbers disadvantage. That said, I wouldn't consider them a particularly generalist unit, as they are not very good against fast fire ships. Even the extra projectiles guaranteed damage has little impact here, and you can see the results are very one sided. In the past, I made a video diving into all of their naval interactions, but the easiest way to summarize it is they add population efficiency and a great counter to Mass Galleon in the late game. So that's their two unique units, and now let's move on to their unique techs. The first is Medical Core, which adds a slow healing rate to all of your elephants. Keep in mind, elephants have a lot of HP, and this actually takes almost 12 minutes to fully heal a battle elephant. Generally, this isn't seen as a very good tech, though the other argument is this does help quite a few units, including also elephant archers and armored elephants, which is their replacement for the battering ram. It's probably slightly more useful than you might think, but considering how much HP elephants have to start with, it's a minor effect, taking about 3 minutes to recover from a single halberdier attack. Their other, much more interesting tech is Woot Steel, which allows their infantry and cavalry to ignore enemy melee armor. The impact of this is actually quite complicated, as it affects a lot of different units and does depend on what they're up against. To start with a focus on light cavalry, with this tech on a spectrum from the Tudan Scout all the way up to a Malian and Bulgarian light cavalry, this actually puts them pretty squarely in the middle. They are lacking bloodlines, husbandry, and the final armor, but Wootsteel clearly counts for something here. 
On the flip side, within this group, they're tied with Vikings for taking the least number of enemy arrows, which automatically makes them among the weakest during raids to Town Center, Arblester, and Castle Fire. While it doesn't give them good light cavalry, they're sneaky strong in melee with this upgrade, especially against high armor enemies. Of course, this also helps their battle elephants, though to a lesser extent. Even after ignoring armor, they still end up the worst aside from Malay, who remember have 40% cheaper elephants in Imperial Age. It's pretty clear this still leaves Dravidians with the worst battle elephants, which you may have guessed from the tech tree to begin with. That said, infantry are really helped by this tech though. I've already done a video breakdown showing lots of matchups and how they fare against other units from Halberdiers to Teutonic Knights, and I won't try to repeat an entire 10 minute analysis here. Generally, the takeaway is they end up on the same level as top tier infantry and are only outdone by Japanese, Slavs with splash damage, and Goths with their massive discount. It's easy to overlook, but this is effectively plus 3 or plus 4 against low armor targets, and really puts them in a class of their own against very high melee armor targets. A Dravidian champion as an extreme example can almost beat a Teutonic Knight one on one, so this is absolutely a tech that puts Dravidian late game barracks units in the top tier, though exactly where they rank depends a bit on what they're up against. Remember, their unique unit is also a big beneficiary, thanks to its charge attack and its accompanying splash damage. So altogether, it's really a lot of units potentially affected and improved by this tech, meaning it's worth picking up unless you're committing to going full on archers. So that's their unique unit and techs, strongly reinforcing Dravidian's infantry and naval focus. To take a broad look at their options though, let's move on and take a look at the tech tree, starting with the archers. Right away, the archery range looks pretty good, with fully upgraded Arblaster, Hand Cannoneer, and faster attacking elite skirmishers. The Elephant Archers also fire faster as well, and can slowly heal with unique tech, though note they don't have Parthian Tactics, Husbandry, and Bloodlines, so they fall quite a bit behind in Imperial Age. The extra 200 wood is handy for either a single archery range in Quick Blacksmith or a double archery range opening. I'd say it's a very solid A- for the variety of good options, mostly held back by the crossbows in Castle Age feeling quite generic. Next up for infantry, you have the full tech tree and all barracks upgrades are of course half price. Unfortunately in Castle Age especially, infantry is pretty exploitable by both crossbows and siege. There's also just a lot of civilizations with infantry stat buffs that I'd put ahead of Dravidians here until you pick up boot steel. Throwing in the Urumi Swordsman though, I think bumps them up to another A-, as at least in the very late game, your infantry becomes almost unstoppable by other melee units, and almost forces your opponent to switch to something ranged. Moving on to cavalry, I apologize for showing it again, but we kinda have to. Obviously it looks terrible when you first look at it, but keep in mind Woot Steel makes their light cavalry better than you might expect in Imperial. I'm gonna stir the pot and say it's a C- and not an F, because I think light cavalry ignoring armor can be surprisingly good now and then. Next up for Siege, like a number of infantry civilizations, they have a pretty good Siege tech tree, including a potentially self-healing armored elephant as a replacement for the battering ram. The only blemish is lacking Siege Engineers, giving you less range on Onagers and Scorpions, or in the Siege Elephant's case, less attack against buildings. Here, I may be a bit more pessimistic and gonna stick with a B. Despite having a ton of options, there's just no bonus to get excited about, and your Siege Onagers are also really not that impressive without Siege Engineers being outranged by even generic Onagers. Moving on to the Navy, this is absolutely a strength of the civilization between their extra early wood, docks giving free houses, and your unique watership on top of a full tech tree. Recently, I looked at the highest win rates for civilizations on water maps, and for pure water maps, Dravidians were technically number one in their online results, as well as consistently top five on hybrid and swamp maps. You can certainly debate if they're the best water civilization, but there's no argument they're in that discussion, with an A plus in the early and late game. It's only in the middle game that they admittedly flounder a little on water, but I still think they're an A plus overall. Taking a quick look at their monks, they're missing the all important redemption, fervor for a bit of speed, and illumination for faster faith regeneration. Heresy is also missing on account of being such an elephant focused civilization. I'd say it's a pretty middling C plus for monks, though having said that, monks are still an important tool against knight sieves, given your lack of camels and knights of your own. Moving on to defenses, their towers are actually fully upgradable, and you have Bracer, which is great for all of your defensive buildings. Overall, I'd give them a B for defenses, as while they are missing a few techs, like I said, they have some difficulty defending against cavalry especially, though the faster attacking skirmishers and elephant archers are nice against archer sifts, so it's a bit situational. And finally, for their trash units, that is, units that don't cost any gold, it looks pretty great until you look at the scout line. 
Remember, your skirmishers attack faster, your halberdier is cheaper to upgrade, and your halberdier and light cavalry can theoretically ignore armor with Wooth Steel, which can sometimes double their damage or do even more, depending on what they're up against. The stats I've seen suggest Dravidians are pretty respectable in games lasting over an hour, and in this case, I'd say it's an A-. So to close up with some final thoughts, despite an overall poor win rate on land maps, Dravidians actually have a good feudal opening with men-at-arms and archers. Castle Age is the tricky part, as relying on crossbows, elephants, or infantry instead of knights or camels means you have a real lack of mobility, with crossbow being probably the safest default choice. One of their biggest issues is actually fighting mangonels, which eat skirmishers, crossbows, infantry, and even elephants to an extent. That said, if you can hang on long enough, I'd argue they have a nice late game revival with their infantry, so at least there is a light at the end of the tunnel. On the other hand, with water maps, they're just a very solid choice, with great bonuses and options in the early and late game. On any water or even hybrid map, I'd be happy to have a Dravidian player on the team helping out everyone's docks and adding the powerful Therissidae in the late game. But speaking of things I love to team up with, big thanks to this video's sponsor Squarespace. If you're an entrepreneur, blogger, or someone looking to build an online presence, but have no idea how to make a website from scratch, Squarespace has you covered with great tools to help you out and simplify the website building process. Using one of their templates, I was able to easily create a website for my urban planning consultation business, Spirit of the Sprawl. Squarespace also has great third-party extensions to handle things like bookkeeping, taxes, shipping, and scheduling to accommodate your specific needs. You just pick a template and domain name and you're good to go. The best part is if you use my code, you get two free weeks to try it out. And if you like it, you get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So hopefully this video either gave you a few ideas or inspired you to give another shot to the Dravidians. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.